My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book and the DeKalb County Public Library, welcome to our Books All Georgians Should Read Award Ceremony for 2016. I always like to tell everyone and kind of remind everyone that um, although we are an office of 1.5 individuals, myself and our program assistant, Zach Steele, who is operating the soundboard back there, <laughs> that we can't do these things without the support of the literary community and the support of a great, great library system. We are so pleased, and I am always so proud, to tell folks that um, our particular center for the book is housed in a public library, um, which I believe gives us great insight into what patrons are reading, gives us great insight into what a community's needs are as far as literature goes, and um, gives us abilities that a center for the book in an academic library or in a humanities council don't have. You know, people can come knock on our door, people can come make suggestions. Um, it's really a community effort, and I think that community effort is supported by, of course, our library systems director, Allison Weisinger. <laughs> she, of course, truly supports our organization, and, you know, best of all, she helps us pay our bills, which in this economy, <laughs> is always welcome. Um, I also would like to thank Jill Joplin, the Cab Library Foundation. Um, they are, of course, the Georgia Center for the Books sponsors, and we cannot do our statewide mission without their support. So thank you, Jill, and thank you to the DeKalb Library Foundation. <laughs> if you don't know about our Library Foundation, um, and if you are curious about your public library, and if your public library has a foundation, I do encourage you to seek out that information. Our particular library foundation does some fantastic programs with literacy and helping people who are post-college, who don't have college degrees, um, learn and get ahead through our English as a Second Language program, through our Thousand Books Before Kindergarten program. Um, we even have librarians who go to um, health clinics and read to children whose parents are receiving free and reduced health care, and that is truly what a public library and a public librarian is meant to do, go out in the community and help those people who need the help of literacy. So thank you to the Library Foundation for that. Um, the library staff, we have library staff members here tonight. I frequently go to the children's section, I frequently go to the staff closet and steal post-it notes, paper clips, pens, gel pens, Sharpies, glue, you name it, I raid the closet when we have a program. Uh, Mia Manikoski, our children's librarian, Denise Funk, who is our Decatur Library Coordinator, um, truly put up with me and all of my eccentricities day after day, so I cannot thank them enough for letting me have our space in the building. Would also like to thank our library foundation. Um, Sarah Fountain here is from the Board of Trustees, um, who keeps our library afloat and makes sure that our ship is going straight ahead and staying on course. I uh, would also like to thank our commissioners. Jeff Rader is here tonight from the DeKalb Library Commission. Um, wonderful folks have always been supportive. Last year, Kathy Gannon actually challenged folks in DeKalb County to read all of the 20 books that are on the Books All Georgians Should Read list. I would also like to thank GPLS. I think Wendy Cornelson is here, um, who's representative of the Georgia Public Library Service. Um, and anyone else who has recommended an author or a book to us, um, you truly make a difference to our organization. I have to say, when I go to the Library of Congress for our meetings, they love the Georgia Center for the Book and they love what we're doing. And that is in a large part to all of you here tonight. You make it so easy by being vocal and vibrant members of our related community. So thank you all so much. Give yourselves a round of applause for that. We also had a wonderful sponsor for our reception over at Square Pub who does a fantastic job. But Baker and Taylor this year, um, who are wholesalers of books, <laughs> came in and helped us sponsor our reception this year. So a thank you to Baker and Taylor and for Jill for helping us coordinate that. Now, the gorgeous 
awards that you all receive tonight. Um, this is the first year that you will get these. You were the first recipients of these particular awards. We have given sort of like these glass books every year and everyone loved them. Um, and although the person who engraved them was here in Georgia, the books themselves weren't made in Georgia. And I thought to myself, if these books are supposed to be by Georgians and about Georgians that all Georgians should read, that a Georgian should create the award. So Nate Nardi, who owns Decatur Glass Blowing, actually handcrafted every single one of these awards for you this evening. Um, so if you look at the table outside, that giant brass stamp was engraved just for us. Um, and then he stamped each and every one of these. So they are truly remarkable. I can't thank Nate enough. He does some amazing stuff. Um, not only does he do these great awards, some of the artistic work he does with glass is unbelievable. So if you have a moment, go check out the gallery. It's wonderful. Um, and I'm just so proud that a Georgian is doing the work to give to Georgians. So... Our first list is, of course, going to start with the books all young Georgians should read. Um, and every year when the council gets together and we call these lists down from, it was over 150 books this time for both the children's list and the adult list combined. And I thank the advisory council and the two committees for all of their work, culling these down and then giving us lists for the final vote. This year, Decatur and Metro Atlanta was also the host for the National Poetry Slam competition. Um, so for the first week in August, there were over 600 poets here in downtown Decatur. There were 72 slam teams. It was an amazing experience. I basically set up shop in the library for a week. I kind of went home and, and, and fell asleep every once in a while. Um, it's truly amazing work. It's not academic poetry, but it doesn't have to be. The clarity, the emotion that these people evoked was unbelievable. I did not know until Monday when the photographer posted the pictures on his blog that this venue on Thursday night was referred to as the bloodbath. Uh, it, was a very, it was a very intense quarterfinal. It was unbelievable. Um, Atlanta's two slam teams were in contention. Unfortunately, the team from Maryland, Slamageddon, won, but they were here, which contributed to said bloodbath. Um, but slam is an amazing form of poetry. It is free form. It is visceral. It is vibrant. It is so connected with not only the community, but what's happening today. Um, so I have three slam poets who are part of the slam teams and who participated in the slam this year um, to talk to you tonight and, and to give us some poetical inspiration um, because they were just unbelievable performers. So the first person this evening is Amy Weaver. She um, was inducted into the Legends of the South here on this stage during the slam. And she performed a poem that was about books and reading. And I immediately said, you have to come to this ceremony and deliver this poem. Um, she is a survivor and a poet and an unbelievable person. So will you please welcome to the stage, Miss Amy Weaver. Y'all doing good? Thank you for having me. recently told me he's only read three books cover to cover in his entire life. Now this is his fourth year of college. <laughs> I'm on my seventh and I'm no doctor but I know there's been a little more required reading than that. And he tells me no sis. I'm not talking science or history. I mean the books that I want to read. Hell if it's any good anyway. They're gonna make it into a movie. His mentality scares me. Because in this fast food, fast forward, handheld, hyper connected society, there are more of him than there are bookworms like me. So, what does this mean for our children? 
Hollywood is a short cutting baby. We like it easy. We park our children in front of TVs, convince ourselves it's okay because it's educational. Hell, Dora the Explorer speaks two languages, but we might as well say hasta luego to their fragile imaginations because we're letting somebody else think for them. We're placing them in training. For the average six hours daily, they spend attached to that idiot box living vicariously through 2D characters on a 32-inch flat screen numb. There is something beautiful in the physicality of turning a page. Something fulfilling in recognizing there is more message in Charlotte's web than just saving a pig. Weaving her magic of insight and understanding, man, she is saving the world. And there's an awareness of this that comes best chapter to chapter at night before bed. Placing the promise of hope in a small child's head, because maybe they can do it too. And you don't get that metaphor from a 90-minute movie. Without the looking glass, Alice was just a lonely girl napping under a tree. We place a higher value on tests than education. And our children are suffering. They don't know how to read between the lines. They don't know how to read. Why bother? They can watch the movie. There's more value in teaching that nothing is more exciting. What you create up here? Hollywood can't subsidize how it makes you feel in here. And it's apparent even to me that we are slipping. From a vice president who misspells potato to America's first son, nuclear W. Bush, even the Ivy League leaders of our nation are often poster boys for illiteracy. We are one of the wealthiest, most advanced countries in the world, and we are quickly becoming the dumbest. With no child left behind, imagination becomes a dirty word, like recess, art, music, poetry. We teach there's more value in test taking than critical thinking. And it only hurts them later to sell them short now. It only hurts us later when we fail to allow them to dream. Conjure metaphors from places unseen. It begins paper to pen. And it is not remote control. Technology makes us lazy takes away our desire to think for ourselves, to discover the wonders of worlds we create for ourselves. We've got to tell them there's nothing more powerful than what's inside you, nothing more dangerous than the outside forces define you, and there's nothing more wireless than a book. There are no chords and no strings, just a whole new world of exciting things that fit between your palms while you're parked at a park beneath the trees with the breeze of spring on the back of your neck, inspiring Mad Hatter, Red Queen, and Cheshire Dreams. Trust me, Georgia, I guarantee the book is better than the movie. Excellent. Thank you so much, Amy, for that. So now we will start with the books all young Georgians should read. So the first book on the list is Simon and the Hope of Sapiens Agenda by Becky Albertalli. And I have a funny story about this book. Um, the book itself is about a young man who is, like many children today, discovering his sexuality and facing bullying. Um, so it, I believe, and like many people on the advisory council believe, this is an important book for some of our young children to have in their hands today. So when I requested a copy from the publisher for our advisory council to take a look at, I got it in the mail and um, I opened the book and I knew about what the book was. And I flipped through it and um, in the package along with the book, there was another item, and I was trying to figure out where this item 
fit in with the book and it just wasn't making sense at all. And I went over to a little shop of stories and I asked Kimberly there, I was like, okay, did I miss something in this book? Because I don't understand why this other item was in the box. So what I eventually figured out is that the box holding Simon and the Hope of Sapiens agenda and someone else's box must have burst open at the post office and they just shoved everything into the boxes and taped it back up because in my box, along with this book by Becky Albert Halley, um, was a carburetor assembly. I have kept this carburetor assembly on my desk for the longest time, um, but it makes a great story. And if you know anybody needs a carburetor assembly, like in the parking lot, I have one. Um, should yours go out this evening? Uh, but so this evening, though, we are giving the honor of a book all young Georgians should read to Becky Albertalli. Our next book on this list is like in so many books about young people, young women, having to deal with diversity and unbelievable odds. I am so happy to say that this book is the first book in a series, um, and we are so thrilled to have Roshani Choksi receive the Books All Young Georgians Should Read Award for her book, The Star Touched Queen. She, of course, went to UGA. She is Emory Law. Um, and I am just so happy that she is continuing her writing career in spite of having to argue in a law classroom. So, for the Star Touched Queen, is Roshini here? Roshani? Now, I may admit that this is one of my favorites um, for several reasons. Um, because I like to say that I think that Georgians find themselves in the pages of these books. This is about a young boy named Joe <laughs> who just happens to like to fold paper and maybe do some little origami every once in a while. Um, but this is a wonderful children's book about a young boy who finds a hobby and then annoys his mother with it, but then takes it and teaches it to young people in his community. It's a great book. Ah, <laughs> oh, already this evening. See, I was like waiting for Teresa before I choked up, but so it's out of the way, you're good. Um, so. Joy Kleber for her picture book this evening, Morigami. <laughs> Written in the Stars is a story about a young girl who is living in the United States and then her parents are Pakistani American and they go back to Pakistan um, and she realizes that although she has this wonderful life here in the United States. Her parents have arranged a marriage for her. Um, so it is about her confronting both this new culture that she is living in and the cultural norms that she has to endure. Um, it's an absolutely powerful book. I cannot tell you how many members of the committee said that this is unbelievable. There are also resources in the book for young girls who are being forced into these marriages and to, to find places and safe places when sometimes their families aren't that place. So. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> you know, books, feelings, poetry. It all goes hand in hand, so it may happen more than once. So, Written in the Stars by Aisha Saeed. Okay, so a fun one that I may not choke up on. Um, this is a truly wonderful children's picture book. I was so happy to meet one half of this writing team. Um, 
she called me and wanted to meet for coffee, and then I had to put her off for the longest time because we were considering this book for the books all young Georgians should read. But it's The Wheels on a Tuk Tuk. It is, of course, a take on the wheels on the bus, but it has this great multicultural flair of a tuk-tuk in India, those three-wheeled taxis. You're driving through the streets. It's Diwali. It's the sights. It's the sounds. Um, and, you know, Georgia is changing. We have such a large Indian community here um, that's so vibrant. So I think this is a perfect book for children to learn about diversity, learn about other cultures. And they're not only Indian Americans, they're also Georgians. So I think The Wheels on the Tuk Tuk by Saritha and Kabir Segal is the perfect book for the books all young Georgians should read. deployed in Middle East right now. Uh, so I'm, you know, my heart is filled with, that, with emotion. And the other thing I want to mention is that when I'm reading the books, I'm reading across Georgia, and when I read this book, I find it is from India, and my other book, The A Bucket of Blessings, is from India. But I find children resonating with the similarities in our culture much more than the differences. They find it funny and interesting, but more about similarities. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Mythology. So many young people love learning about Greek myths, Roman myths, Norse myths. Um, that Vicki Schechter, who is a docent at the Carlos Museum, and such a great storyteller and expert on all these. This is her third book in the series. She is, of course, the author of Anubis Speaks and Hades Speaks, but this novel is Thor Speaks, about the Norse god of thunder. Um, I am very happy to say that Vicki, several years ago, agreed to sit on the advisory council. Um, she, of course, goes out of the room when we vote on the books. Um, but I am so happy to say that this particular book that I think can be used in so many classrooms and enjoyed by so many children, Thor Speaks, is a book that all young Georgians should read. <laughs> I think one of the most gorgeous picture books lately that has come out by a Georgia author um, is Swan, The Life and Dance of Anna Pavlova. Laurel Snyder has been on the books All, Georgian, All Young Georgians Should Read before um, for one of her mid-grade novels. But this particular book, um, in its unbelievable illustrations, started out with the idea that Laurel pitched to her editor of, can you make a children's book where the main character dies? And Laurel tells the story much better, but she said, her editor said that you can do anything as long as you do it well. It is a bestseller. I can't tell you how many young girls in little pink tutus clutch this book as they leave all of our independent bookstores in the community. And that is why Swan, The Life and Dance of Anna Pavlova is a book all young Georgians should read. Laurel Snyder. The Meaning of Maggie by Megan Jean Sovern. Unfortunately, Megan could not be here tonight. Um, she has a young daughter who unfortunately came down with a stomach bug. Um, but I can just tell you that Megan is a truly giving author. Um, she came and did the um, book club here at Decatur, talked with the children, they all made buttons and things like that because they always do some kind of a craft. Um, but I am so pleased that the meeting of Maggie made it onto the list this year and I look forward to do many, many programs with Megan in the next year. So Megan Jean Sovereign.
so we have a debut novelist, like many of novelists here this evening, um, Lisa Lewis Tyre, for Last in the Long Line of Rebels, is about, of course, a young girl who has to confront the prejudices in a small town. And I think that's what a lot of children have to face in not only Georgia, but across the South today. That there are changing attitudes and changing ideals, and although there may be a little part of history that you want to cling to, because it's good for your heart, um, it may not always be good in the bigger picture. So we are so pleased that Lisa Tyre's book is a book that all young Georgians should read. So, Lisa Lewis Tyre. Merman, book three, The Deep Dive. Graphic novels are such a large part of children's and young adult, and even the adult book industry. Um, they're not just comic books anymore. Folks don't always have capes. They don't always have superpowers. Um, and even last year, of course, you know that John Lewis's The March was on our list of books all young Georgians should read. So this is an amazing new format that engages readers in ways that may be turned off by a traditional book or may have difficulty with a traditional book. Um, but Joey Weezer from Athens has produced this great series about Merman, the Merman, and all of his great adventures. And we look forward to many, many more adventures from Merman to come. So for his book, Merman, book three, deep dive, Joey Weezer. So before we get to the books all Georgians should read, or the adult list, um, one of the gentlemen that helped bring the poetry slam to Atlanta, Daryl Fun, also known as Mr. Fun. Mr. Fun, I know. I, oh, I, I've worked on that. I've worked on that. Um, but he was instrumental in bringing the poetry slam to Atlanta. Um, and it was great working with him and, and seeing his energy and his enthusiasm for this form. Um, I asked him to perform a particular poem this evening that he performed on WABE during the slam um, that I think resonates with so many people um, in America today. So you please welcome Mr. Fun. Give me the great introduction of Mr. Fun, and then you want me to do this particular poem. We'll see how that works out, okay. Oh, good, I got you all laughing now, so that's good. All right, um, I wanna thank you for this opportunity. Um, when he asked me, I was like super uber excited, so I've been like texting my mom, like, hey mom, guess what, I'm about to perform a poem in front of some people. So, all right. <clears throat> Somewhere there are killing fields thirsty for blood, hungry for the charred remains of independence. And there are men, never taught to appreciate the cardiac organ, so Uncle Sam will train them to be heartless, precision caretakers, taking care of everything that moves on the battlefield. All signs of civility are castrated from the mind. Any fears you may have, bury them. You are caught in the crosshairs of kill or be killed. The blood races. The adrenaline kicks in. The air is thin. Triggers like aloe soothe itchy fingers. There seems to be a millennium between sanity and the reaction time to enemy fire. Stay calm, soldier. Respond. Don't react. Run from death. Make it through the day. Try to come back in one piece. This soldier who completes his second tour in less than two years comes home to a divided nation that only complains about why he serves his country. No one cares that he is homeless, so he will crawl into shallow glass graves, hoping the alcohol will drown the visions of bodies dancing in his head. No one notices the world of mass depression breaking his spirits as the VA denies his post-traumatic stress claim because it was a pre-existing condition. Somewhere, there are little souls, thirsty for peace of mind, hungry for the charred remains of a normal life, and there are men. 
Never taught to readjust so Uncle Sam will send them without deprogramming to live in a land they no longer remember. All signs of civility are amputated from the mind. He feels like he's in combat when he's awake. They are reoccurring images when he's asleep. The anxiety he feels is impossible to bury. One in four soldiers returning from war will be diagnosed with some psychological disorder. Healing happens with jagged edges and families become a collection of veins hoping today they will be missed. His children, they learn quickly, run, hide when daddy gets like this. He is unemployed, but classified mentally unstable with an honorable discharge. His mind is a constant war zone and he is not fit for combat. The pressure mounts. He is caught in the crosshairs of paying back the Department of Defense before he can collect his $80 a month to live from the VA. The blood races. The adrenaline kicks in. The air is thin. It seems like a millennium since the last time he was able to hear fireworks. Without conjuring images of the front line, you're home now. The boy with the backpack is not carrying explosives. He is the neighbor's son who wrote you letters every two weeks. You're home now. We will never understand the price you paid to keep us safe. You're home now. You're home now. She is your wife, not the enemy. She did not mean to surprise you from behind with a kiss. Let her go. Stop screaming at the traffic chop of your coordinates for pickup. Your government, they will not come for you. You're home now. Thank you. You now see why Thursday night was called the bloodbath here at the library. Very, very powerful. Thank you so much, Daryl. So our first book on the books all Georgians should read is by Jim Ock Moody. He is a 29-year veteran of the AJC. He was a writer and editor. He was also twice nominated, twice won the Cox Newspaper Writer of the Year. And of course, his book is about a young man growing up in a small Christian community in Georgia who has to confront the fact that people in his small town treat him poorly because he chooses not to treat the blacks in his community differently. So the book, Class of 65, I think speaks to many things that are important and going on today and why I am so glad that this book, this year, is a book that all Georgians should read. So Jim, thank you so much. Jim Ockmoody. <laughs> so much for this recognition. Authors love any recognition, you know. <laughs> but I think this is really recognition for the people that this story is about. This is recognition for the people who grew up in this Christian community, Koinonia, the birthplace of Habitat for Humanity, who were bombed and shot and persecuted in every which way back in the 50s and 60s because of their belief in racial brotherhood. It's recognition for the civil rights protesters and activists in Albany and Americas who hit the streets, spent time in jail, some of them 12, 13 years old, uh, to build a more just Georgia. And it's also recognition for the, he mentioned Greg Whitcamper, the um, kid from Koinonia who was mistreated so badly at America's High School, the class of 65 that the title refers to. Uh, it's also recognition for his white classmates who mistreated him very badly at that time, but who felt the stirrings of, 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 of moral ambiguity in their souls and were open to changing and broadening their minds over the years, and uh, who many years later reached out to Greg in an effort to make amends. And you know, when I was working on this book, I was so afraid there was going to be this terrible downer about ugly things that happened in the Deep South 50 and 60 years ago. And it is indeed partially about that. But what really drew me to it as a subject was because of the way people change, the way we all have a capacity to become better people, and the way these people, in different ways, showed moral courage. This, this book is really about moral guts, and this is in recognition of them. Thank you very much.
Our next book is, of course, a book of fiction. It is a debut novel by an author who grew up on the Georgia coast. Um, he is also the winner of the Montana Prize for Fiction. Um, and his book, Fallen Land, is about a couple who is fleeing a gang of marauders in Georgia during the Civil War. Um, I am pleased to say that Taylor Brown, this book is a book that all Georgians should read, but his second book, River Kings, is forthcoming. So we look forward to a long, long career for this debut Georgia author. So Taylor Brown, thank you. Southern Tufts, the regional origins and the craze for chenille fashion is a wonderful history book about Georgia. Um, from peacock kimonos to shrimp capes to Roy Rogers robes, um, chenille was a national fashion trend um, that started right here in North Georgia and that you can still see flapping in the breeze sometimes on a Saturday afternoon if you go driving on the roads in North Georgia. Um, of course, its author, Ashley Callahan, gave a wonderful, wonderful program here. Not only is it a great history book about a bit of Georgia history, um, but she is a fantastic collector of chenille fashion. So you please welcome Ashley Callahan. I can't pull that off now. No, it's, yeah, no. So our next book, Twain's End, is another by Lynn Cullen. Lynn has been a friend of the Georgia Center for the Book since her first book, and not just her first adult book, um, but her first children's book. Of course, that started back when she was writing about Marie Antoinette and progressed when she was writing about Rembrandt's daughter. Uh, but this particular book, Twain's End, you may think is about Mark Twain, but it's not. It's actually about his secretary, Isabel Lyon, and what an interesting story that is. And I hope that since this is a book that all Georgians should read, you will discover her story this year. So please welcome Lynn Cullen for Twain's End. <laughs> say a word that you have been a friend to me. Um, I go way back. I used to come here and, and uh, dream about being one of the authors here. And we're both going to cry. Um, it meant so much to me to have this resource. And I dreamed I would be up here. And this is my third of these. And it's every time it's a, a marvel. And you don't know how much this helps a writer to get this affirmation and to have people like you to to back us up. We really need that. We need readers. Writers are nothing without readers and without people like you. So thank you so very much. And We gave out gold medals for how many times Joe is going to weep behind a podium tonight. I would definitely, definitely, you know, be right up there with Michael Phelps. But thank you so much, Lynn. That's very much appreciated. So, Where We Want to Live by Ryan Gravel. Um, this is a spectacular book about the man who helped create the belt line. And... We all know about the belt line. We've all heard about the belt line. And people want to recreate this same idea in their communities all over the United States. Um, that's why, you know, when we looked at this book, it's not just about Atlanta, but it's about replicating this same sense of community throughout Georgia and throughout the United States. Um, Ryan is receiving a, another award this evening, so he could not be here. 
Uh, he's in demand, yeah. So, um, but we are so very pleased that his book, Where You Want to Live, is a book that all Georgians should read this year. So Ryan Gravel. Another book about confronting racism and confronting our prejudices is Jim Grimsley, How I Shed My Skin. And it's his memoir about growing up in the South and turning a corner on his personal beliefs. Jim is, of course, the author of Boulevard and of Forgiveness and has come to the center for the book so many times to talk about his book. But I think no time has he given a more powerful lecture than when he was talking about this particular book. And that is why I'm so happy that Jim's book, How I Shed My Skin, is a book all Georgians should read this year. Now, I'm a fan of books, but I do recognize they're a fan of this thing called sports out there. Um, you know, and sometimes, you know, to get fans of sports to read, you have to have sports books. So, um, Ty Cobb, A Terrible Beauty by Charles Learson this year is a book that all Georgians should read. And it talks about that great Georgia figure, the Georgia peach, Ty Cobb. And you will find out so many things about him. And he even discusses that famous and infamous picture and how it may not be exactly what we all thought. Um, but of course, to figure out what that picture actually is, you're going to have to read the book. <laughs> so this year, Ty Cobb, A Terrible Beauty by Charles Learson is a book that all Georgians should read. Another debut novelist um, who is just a great guy. He's a man in a hat um, and always infuses any event, whether it is a reading of the Georgia Literary Festival or tonight, um, with his own brand of style, humor, and Georgia forthrightness. Um, the novel itself was written in the office of a fire department in his spare time. Um, because like many Georgia novelists, and Terry Kay has wanted to tell you, um, there is no novelist that's really a full-time novelist that you are always doing it while working another job. But Bull Mountain is a truly praised book. It was an ITW award winner for best novel. It won the Pat Conroy Award for mystery. And it's been nominated for the Barry Award, the Townsend Prize for Fiction, and the LA Times Book Award. And I am so glad that a fireman has turned to an author for his book, Bull Mountain. So you please welcome Brian Panowich. <laughs> Blue Laws by Kevin Young. Uncollected, selected and Uncollected Poems, 1995 through 2015. Kevin's book of, was um, the great album on the blackness of blackness was on our previous books, All Georgians Should Read list. He has given so much to the literary community here in Metro Atlanta and in Georgia and done so much for the poetry community in Georgia. Um, he's been great to have here. Um, I am so glad to see him go. He is going on to bigger and better things, we all hope. It's always an open invitation to come on back. We are a welcoming folks. Um, so anytime, feel free. But I am so very glad that we still have the opportunity to claim Kevin Young for our books, All Georgians Should Read list for Blue Laws. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thanks. 
And our last book this evening is a bit of Georgia history. Um, and we've had this book both presented at the Georgia Literary Festival and here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And I always like to extol what great work is being done at the University of Georgia Press. Um, they are truly producing not only quality literature, but absolutely beautiful books. I think we should all be extremely proud of the University of Georgia Press and what is coming out from them. Um, it's always a pleasure to work with them, and it's a pleasure to see this kind of quality of book uh, being made right here in Georgia. Memories of the Mansion, the story of Georgia's governor's mansion, of course talks the book about the building designed by architect a. Thomas Bradbury that opened in 1968 and the transformations and iterations that that building has gone through over its span. Of course, there are several authors and contributors to the book. Um, Jennifer Dickey, of course, was here to talk about her previous book, A Tough Little Patch of History. Catherine Lewis, of course, came to the Georgia Literary Festival to present this book as well, and Sandra Deal. So right now I would like to welcome Jennifer Dickey to accept her trophy this evening. And Catherine Lewis to accept her trophy this evening. And of course, you know, the First Lady of Georgia is a friend to Georgia Libraries. She is, of course, a champion of literacy and truly making sure that all Georgia's children um, have the library resources that they need with the Thousand Books Before Kindergarten program. So you please welcome the First Lady of Georgia, Sandra D. Deal. So, of course, we started the evening with poetry. We will close the evening with poetry. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I'm not the only one. So, um, Teresa Davis, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, she is a member of the Artemuk Slam team. She has been Women of the World Slam champion before. Um, her first book, After This We Go Dark, came out a few years ago from Sibling Rivalry Press. And she just continues to burn it up and inspire every time she takes the stage. Um, she comes by it honestly. Her mother is, of course, Alice Lovelace, who is the godmother of slam poetry in Atlanta. Um, so I think if Alice is the godmother, then Teresa has to be the high priestess. Um, <laughs> Her new book is coming out, um, and it is an amazing piece of work. I can't truly say enough about Teresa. I think she is an unbelievable poet. Um, she's a mother. She's a teacher. Um, and she just continues to inspire folks. Um, and even with her new book, we will learn that, you know, mermaids never drown because they can swim. Um, so will you please welcome to the stage Teresa Davis.
but you wanted to so bad that you buried whatever you thought could be held against you in the backyard next to G.I. Joe and Barbie. Now, this is the part of the poem where I need you to remember who you used to be so you can fully appreciate, understand what happens next. For the sixth grade science teacher, who after a female in his class asked to be excused twice during his lesson, felt it was appropriate to announce to her classmates that it must be her time of the month. Before your statement, science was her favorite subject. She was going to cure cancer, return renegade memories to Alzheimer's patients. She hates science now. And what I think she really means is that she hates you. But the cause and effect of your forked tongue has left her casualty, period. And for the seventh grade English teacher, when her supreme wisdom saw fit to suspend a 13-year-old boy for three days because the wind blew at the wrong time and, well, things became erect. Now she doesn't understand why he won't talk to her, why he is so cautious in her classroom turned minefield. He is silent because that is the one thing he can control. And since she seems determined to punish him for the things that he can't, why would he give her more ammunition? She is cautious because she has turned enemy can. And now you want to scream zero tolerance. Like that's synonymous with hijack your own common sense. I have zero tolerance policy in my classroom. Talk doing one of my tests. Watch me. Hand grenade, launch your efforts. Five moves to the nearest spiritual following receptacle. But in 2009, when Simon stood erect, set a pencil on his desk in the middle of one of my mad tests and said, Mr. Teresa, I'm just saying, if Freddie Mercury were alive today, we would not be at war with Iraq. <laughs> I think three thoughts simultaneously. First, I think, he knows who Freddie Mercury is. <laughs> Second, I think his parents are amazing because he knows who Freddie Mercury is. And third, I think, you know what? He could be right. <laughs> who am I to punish him for his insight when teaching our children? We have to remember we were once one of them. And shaming them about these bodies they are trying to invade, these voices they are struggling to own, it will not win us their trust. It will only render us untrustworthy. So educators, choose your battles. Lower your voice sometimes. You can better hear theirs. You do this, and I guarantee our young people, they will. They will rock you. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you so much, Daryl, Amy, Allison, Sarah, Mrs. Deal, Governor Deal for being here this evening. Just a reminder to all of you that Acapella Books is out in the lobby. They have copies of all of the books that Georgians should read. Feel free to pick up a copy for you, for someone. All of our authors, if you will make your way over to the little meeting room next door, um, we'll have a book signing um, so you can get those inscribed for loved ones. Thank you all so, so very much. Continue to support your libraries and continue reading. We'll see you all next year.